The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the My Matrix webinar on the patent wars, Big Pharma versus Generics. My name is Lori Taylor. I'm Director of Marketing with My Matrix. I'd like to welcome you again today. I'm going to go over just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, today's webinar is going to be one hour in length. It will be recorded and available within the next week on MyMatrix.com. We are offering CE credits for staff adjusters, certified case managers, and RNs. Um, soon after this webinar, an email will be sent to you with a link to register for CE credit. Uh, please do so by June 16th. And um, also throughout today's session, please submit any questions you may have in the chat pane for the presenters. And we'll get to as many questions as possible uh, towards the end of the session. I want to introduce our speakers today. First, we have Phil Walls. He's Chief Clinical and Compliance Officer for MyMatrix. He oversees all aspects of MyMatrix's clinical program and manages the corporately owned and operated mail service pharmacy. Um, he's a clinical pharmacist with over 25 years of experience in pharmacy, healthcare informatics, and workers' compensation. He's a published author and frequent speaker on many workers' compensation topics, specifically the use of opioids. And he's also the 2011 Dorlin, uh, Dorlin Health People Pharmacist Award recipient. Our second speaker today is Dawn Rayner. She's a shareholder with Young, Moore & Henderson in Raleigh, North Carolina. She's in the Employment and Workers' Compensation Practice Group and defends employers in employment-related matters and workers' compensation litigation. Her experience includes counseling clients, investigating claims, and representation of employers in litigated matters at mediations, hearings, and appeals. Uh, she regularly responds to agency investigations and administrative proceedings before the EEOC, North Carolina Industrial Commission, and the North Carolina and U.S. Departments of Labor. Um, real quickly, our agenda today, we're going to be going over uh, drug development, why prescriptions are so costly, a patent overview, brands versus generics, and several case studies and then sum it up with an impact to workers' compensation and, again, take your questions and hopefully provide you with some answers today. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Phil Walls, and we're going to get started. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, what we're looking at on the screen right now is a, a drug molecule. Uh, at this particular point, it doesn't really matter which one it is. Uh, I can tell you it's a single source brand. Um, it has been around since uh, May of 1994 is when it was first discovered. It was approved by the FDA for um, uh, general use December of 1998, and its patent is due to expire uh, in about a year, uh, May of 2014. So I thought this would be a good place to start because when we talk about patents, the drug itself or a molecule like this is one of the things that is being patented. Uh, however, as, as Dawn is going to explain in just a little while, that's not necessarily the only thing that a drug company can patent. So we look at uh, this molecule, and each drug has three different names. The, the first name is tied to the chemical structure. And, and on this screen, what we're looking at is basically a chemist uh, shorthand version of the molecule that we saw on the previous screen. Now, to, to work with something like this, Chemists have very detailed uh, rules for naming a compound like this. This particular one, its name of all things is 4,5,4-methylphenyl-3-trifluoromethyl-pyrazole-1-in-il-benzene-sulfonamide. Uh, quite a mouthful. Certainly nothing that physicians could easily remember to write a prescription on. Like I said, that's the first of three names. The second name is actually the generic name. In this case, it's Celecoxib. Now, with generic names, there aren't nearly as many rules about how a drug is named, uh, although there are some requirements. Uh, it's not coincidence that all penicillins end in the suffix psyllin. So that way, we know that penicillin, amoxicillin, ampicillin are all related. Uh, another category that we're all familiar with in comp uh, are the 
uh, synthetic opioids, um, oxycodone, hydrocodone. It's no coincidence that they enter end in that same uh, suffix, and that way clinicians can know when drugs are related very quickly just by uh, partly the generic name. Not so with the brand name. The brand name for this particular drug, and you may have already guessed, is Celebrex. Brand names have no requirements as to how the drug is named. They strictly are a marketing tool. The drug company is looking for something that's uh, easy to remember uh, because, quite frankly, they want to make it very easy for a physician to think about this drug when, he's, when he or she is thinking about a particular condition so that this is what they prescribe. So the brand name is strictly marketing. What's important to, to realize here is that the generic name comes first. So even though a drug may still be covered under patent and therefore considered a single source brand and it goes by the brand name, the generic name already exists. And I've actually had questions over the years about when someone will come across uh, an article referring to a generic name, the assumption sometimes is, well, it must be available as a generic drug. That's not true. So all drugs have three names, including the generic, even before generics hit the market. Now, before I turn it over to Don, we're talking about a, a multi-billion dollar industry. And to just sort of set the stage for today, uh, I looked at this morning's headlines. So keep in mind, what I'm about to talk about came from just one morning's news releases. Uh, the first one was Endo to cut 700 jobs. Okay, Endo, if you're not familiar with them, uh, is the maker of Lidoderm, one of the most costly drugs in workers' compensation today. It's no coincidence that that huge layoff is preceding the patent expiration on Lidoderm, uh, which is due this coming September. Um, Another headline, Citizen Lawsuit Tries to Force Action Against Ranbaxy in India. Uh, Ranbaxy is a very large pharmaceutical company uh, and not uh, coincidental that India and generic pharmaceutical company is showing up in the headlines. India is one of the major producers of generic drugs in the world. Uh, third one that I want to look at, uh, Momenta, uh, which is the company that makes brand name Lovinox, uh, a blood thinner not seen too often in comp but certainly you are going to see it in, in certain cases. Uh, Momenta pleads for Supreme Court review in Lovenox generic case. So big pharma, generics, uh, uh, international considerations like India are daily headlines in the news. So with that, Don, um, I want to hand it over to you because for, for years I've been talking about drug development and patents, and I've assured folks that, that drugs have a 20-year patent when the patent expires, generic drugs can hit the market. And yet lately, that's not necessarily what I'm seeing. It seems to be taking longer than the traditional patent period. Uh, if you could sort of help, help us understand that. Absolutely. Thanks, Phil. Um, good afternoon, everyone. We definitely appreciate you all taking some time out of your afternoon to listen to some talk on this subject. It's an important one for all of us engaged in workers' compensation litigation because, as you all know and experience every day, the cost of prescription medication in some workers' compensation claims is absolutely through the roof. Oftentimes, it's a, a, disinclin a disinclinator for settlement and uh, resolution of claims. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the legal landscape, about how it is that Big Pharma is able to maintain the profits that they do and the patents that they do on some of the big name um, drugs that we see every day. So let's talk about why prescriptions are so costly, particularly in the United States. Total spending on medication um, in the United States in 2012 was $325.8 billion. There are several reasons why medications in the U.S. are so expensive, and frankly, we don't have time to go over all of them, but I do want to outline a couple that are pertinent to our conversation. First of all, and this isn't a shock to any of you, Americans take a lot of prescription medication. Um, our drug use prescrip of prescription drugs during the last decade, from 1999 to 2011, has increased by 40%. That outpaces population growth by about 4%. So, the truth is that we're taking more medications than we have historically. Secondly, brand name drugs are particularly expensive. 
So while the percentage of all prescriptions, um, the, prescri the percentage of generic drugs in all prescriptions is increasing, the percentage of actual dollars going to pay for brand name drugs continues to outpace spending for generic drugs. Um, in our first world culture, and particularly in our workers' compensation arena, patients expect the best medical treatment available. Um, and that includes medications that are going to cure every malady that we have, medications that are proven to be safe, and companies who are innovation who are innovation focused and looking for new drugs. Finally, and maybe most importantly in our discussion, our pharmaceutical industry has grown on really large profits historically, and they are constantly seeking ways to preserve those profits. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. Does it really cost billions and billions of dollars to foster the innovation and creativity of safe drugs? Um, maybe yes, maybe no. Let's first look at the way new drugs are approved in the United States. Um, what do pharmaceutical companies have to do to bring a new drug to market? First is the Food and Drug Administration. The FDA is responsible for approving new, generic, and over-the-counter drugs. But as we all know, new drugs receive the most extensive scrutiny, and that includes proof of efficacy, which is documented through controlled clinical trials. If the FDA doesn't approve a drug, the company cannot release it, sell it, market it. It's dead on arrival. So to get through the clinical trial process really is quite lengthy and quite costly. I live um, very close to the Research Triangle Park here in North Carolina, and within a 30-mile radius, we have three major research universities and more than three or four companies that assist pharmaceutical companies navigate their way through the clinical trial process. They do this by collecting clinical trial data, analyzing the data, running the trials. Believe me when I say it's a cottage industry in my neck of the woods, millions of dollars are going into these companies who do nothing but run and analyze clinical data material. So it is true that research and development to meet the requirements of the FDA is expensive. The question is, though, does research and development really merit the profit that's generated by big drug companies through their uh, branded medication? So let's move on to the next slide and talk a little bit about how they protect their profits in um, these pharmaceutical companies. So let's say that pharmaceutical company A has indeed invested millions of dollars in research and development for the next big drug, the next OxyContin or Lyrica or whatnot. But wait a minute, the pharmaceutical company down the street has gotten wind of this new drug and now there's a race to market. How do the pharmaceutical companies protect their golden eggs? or in this case, their golden pill, the way they do it is through patent protection. As you all know, a patent permits the owner of the patent or a new invention to exclude all others from making, using, importing, or selling the patented invention for some period of time. There is really a long history of support for patents. As early as 500 BC, we have evidence that Greeks would pr protect um, inventors and their new inventions for a period of one year. Our founding fathers built the ability of Congress to issue patents into the very constitution of our country. Um, there's a long history of, of protecting patents to ensure innovation and creativity. And in theory, patent protection is a grand idea. It does foster innovation. It does foster entrepreneurship. It does foster the American dream. The problem in this case is in application. Let's move on to the next screen. Um, typically, as Phil said earlier, a drug patent is issued uh, in the United States that lasts for 20 years. Um, usually, almost always, frankly, the pharmaceutical company will seek the patent as soon as the new compound is discovered. And usually that's very early in the research and development life cycle of a drug. So that by the time that the drug has gone through the FDA gauntlet, the actual life of the patent is more like 8 to 12 years and sometimes significantly less than that. So once the pharmaceutical company has gone through this whole process, they really don't have a 20-year period during which they have market exclusivity. Congress has, has tried to address that by um, passing laws that extend that period of market exclusivity to the brand name drugs to kind of compensate for that period during which they were getting FDA approval. Um, but despite those congressional concessions, drug patent holders 
uh, two drug patent holders, Big Pharma keeps looking for ways to extend the patent. That's the name of the game. They're trying to extend the patent over the initial lifespan that they had in the initial 20 years. Um, as we'll see, their efforts have largely been successful, frankly. Um, and so it's allowing Big Pharma to continue monopolistic pricing on certain drugs that we all see on a daily basis for periods in far, far in excess of the drug's original patent period. Um, we'll find out how drug companies are finding the, the creative ways to extend patents in just a moment. But first, let's frame the debate. Um, Big Pharma would say that extended patents are necessary to provide enough revenue to cover, cover R&D. Sometimes R&D is risky. Sometimes you discover something new that you think can be the great new drug, and it either doesn't prove you know, as effective as they thought it would, or it's not approved by the FDA, and so all of that money goes into not. Um, they also argue that extended patents are necessary to foster the innovation that's necessary to create new drugs. Of course, the critics would say that extended patents exclude patients in the developing world from receiving the effective treatment that they so desperately need. Of course, we've seen this so often in the AIDS uh, medication debate. They also argue that extended patents steer drug manufacturers to focus on production of really lucrative drugs rather than drugs that are effective or needed. And finally, and probably from our perspective, the biggest criticism is that extended patents are a significant factor in the exponential rise in healthcare costs. In fact, many critics would argue that extended patents are nothing but a, a pure profit generator to line the pockets of big pharma. Phil, what do you think about that debate? Yes, in a way, a tough question. Um, when we look at the, the last bullet point under big pharma's position to foster innovation and new drug development, um, I absolutely support that. That's what the patent system was designed to do. It is how this, um, the, the industry has developed new therapies. Um, I mean, it's incredible to think of the cures that we have today, uh, the advances that we've made in cancer treatment, uh, in HIV and AIDS treatment. And yet, on the other hand, I, I look at some of the, the drugs that we refer to as a, a Me Too drug, and I feel like the patent system is being abused. A um, great example of this is the drug uh, Amrix, uh, which fortunately had a very short-lived um, life as a single-source brand. Uh, Amrix was nothing more than uh, uh, an extended-release version uh, of cyclobenzaprine, which is known by the brand name Flexeril. The necessity of that and the expense is questionable. So we have drugs like that. But then on the other hand, we do have innovation. Um, there's been concern that Big Pharma has been investing less and less in research and development. But what I do know is that last year, for the first time in quite a while, the FDA approved more new drugs than they have uh, for years. Uh, last year, the FDA approved 39 new drug entities. Uh, so that's encouraging. Uh, it does sound like Big Pharma is getting them back on track to deliver innovation. Um, so, like I said, the question is tough. Um, uh, you could say it's a tough pill to swallow, but uh, it's a, sort of a necessary evil. Right. I feel I totally agree with you. I mean, I think that the innovation is clearly necessary. As I said, it, it was written into, the, into our Constitution that we're going to protect invention. We're going to encourage innovation so that we have you know, the drugs that we need to address all of the problems that we face medically. The problem is the balance and how to curtail the abuses that are taking place in the patent world that are allowing extensions of patents that perhaps ought not to be generated. Um, so we sort of understand the value of a patent, but where do generic drugs come into play in this whole scenario? Um, a generic drug manufacturer can't produce and sell a generic version of a drug unless or until that original patent expires, or the generic company certifies that the original patent is invalid, unenforceable, or won't be infringed. That second option is always going to involve litigation that's costly. Um, they, can, they can produce a generic if the original drug never held a patent, but as we see, that's almost never the case on a lucrative drug. 
And then finally, they could produce and sell a drug, a generic drug, in a country without patent protection. However, we have trade agreements with virtually every country in the world, which requires at least some minimum support for intellectual property and trade or, um, patent protection, so that really there are no countries in the world where a generic manufacturer can go and produce without threat of patent infringement. So practically then, the generic manufacturers in this country either wait for the patent to expire on a brand name drug, or they become more aggressive and develop a generic version and then try to bring it to market knowing that they're going to face a patent infringement claim from the big pharma company. Let's look at what happens when the generic does enter the market. Why are the brand name producers so against generics coming on the scene? Well, the, the primary reason is profit. Once a generic drug enters the market, the price of that particular drug drops by 80% or more. Um, more and more generics are being filled in this country. The percentage of all prescriptions filled with a generic is up significantly over the last decade, as you can see. In 2002, generics made up 54% of prescriptions filled, whereas in 2012, generics made up 84%. Um, that rise in generic use in our country has cut the nation's tab for prescription medications by 1%, and that's the first decline since the tracking began in 1957. Still, though, as we saw at the beginning of the, pre of the presentation, brand name drugs, even though they're prescribed less than they once were, they still make up the bulk of a total prescription drug spending in the United States. So let's talk about how Big Pharma is able to continue generating such large profits from these medications. Um, there are several ways that have been really sort of creative under the whole patent scheme. First, let me tell you about one that's really not mentioned on this page, and that is the practice of obtaining multiple patents on one drug. The landscape with patents used to be that a pharmaceutical company would create a drug and obtain one patent for that drug. Over the last decade, though, um, the pharmaceutical companies have taken to the method of obtaining multiple patents on various components and indications of a single drug. So for instance, now there could be two, three, four, even five patents on one drug. That way, if one patent isn't extended by the um, FDA for some reason, then they have the chance of extending another patent on the drug, thereby um, continuing the patent process. There are two other ways. One's called evergreening. Um, evergreening is where a pharmaceutical company makes some sort of change to the original drug, whether it's a change in formula, a change in the delivery of the drug, in the purification, or if there are new indications allegedly found for the drug. And frankly, sometimes new patents are evergreen, that is the patent is extended. Um, for, these are innovative changes, and these are good for the consumer. For instance, Phil's going to talk a little bit later about OxyContin. You all probably heard that um, OxyContin has received an extended patent recently because it's now um, formulated such that it has more of, of a deterrent against abuse. Obviously, that's a change in the formula of the drug that is helpful for the consumer. On the other hand, and perhaps more often, pharmaceutical companies make a small, insignificant change to a drug or to its dosage indication or to its indication for treatment. Um, and oftentimes this happens just when the original version is about to come off patent. So this gives the manufacturer an extended period of time during which they'll have control over the brand name prices of the drug. Um, Let's, talk, let's get to the next screen for just a minute, Lori, and talk about how other countries are dealing with this. Unfortunately, uh, let's move on to the next one, to the um, evergreening screen, and we'll come back to this one. Unfortunately, in the United States, courts and regulators, frankly, aren't doing very much about this evergreening issue. But other countries are, um, and I wanted to talk to you briefly about those. The United States has negotiated trade agreements with virtually every other country in the world. One big one is the TRIP the agreement uh, on trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. This agreement applies to virtually every country in the world and requires a minimum standard for property protection. The big question then is with these countries, 
how are they going to interpret what is a new indication or a new formula for a drug? Um, this question has arisen in Canada, in Australia, and most recently in India. Novartis had a very profitable drug that they were marketing in India, and they were seeking um, a, a renewal of their patent for a minor change in the formula of the drug. And the Indian Supreme Court in April of this year said, nah, -uh, we smell a rat. We're not going to let you extend the patent of this drug because the change you made in the formula is simply not sufficient enough, not significant enough to merit a new patent. Of course, the impact of that is that now generic manufacturers of this same drug in India are able to market the drug at much lower cost. Um, and this is a trend in other developing countries in the world. To date, though, um, while there are evergreening critics in the United States, there's really been no congressional action nor any suits brought which curtail the practice in a significant way. Um, and it's interesting to note, of course, that the U.S. is the largest producer of brand name drugs in the world, in direct contradiction to India. So my prediction is we're not going to see a lot of action on this evergreen process unless uh, there's an outcry from the insurance world and other consumer protection groups. Um, Lori, if we could, let's get back to the previous screen and talk about the other way that pharmaceutical companies can extend their patents in a, in a little bit more creative way. This way is called, it's been dubbed the pay to delay agreement or a reverse payment agreement. Let me tell you a little bit about that. So let's say that you've got a generic company that wants to bring a generic drug to market. And they're one of the aggressive ones who say, to heck with that patent. We're going to go ahead and develop this drug, and we're going to bring it to market. And of course, the inevitable happens. The brand name manufacturer gets wind that this is going, is going on. And so they bring suit against the generic manufacturer saying, no, 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 you can't violate our patent. And then, of course, there is litigation over the patent issue. It's costly for everybody. Not uncommonly, as we see every day in our world, the parties try to reach a settlement agreement. Well, the settlement agreement between these parties recently has, has gone this way. If if the generic company is successful in that patent litigation, in other words, if they prove that the original patent is invalid or that it's not enforceable, then they have the right to market the generic drug for six months exclusively so that no other generic manufacturers can market that drug. They get all the profit from the initial generic offering for six months. So the big brand name pharmaceutical company will come in and say to the generic company, look, if you promise not to put your generic drug on the market for, you know, however long, for five more years until our patent expires or whatever the time period is, then we will pay you. And what we will pay you is commensurate with that six-month period when you would have gotten exclusive generic um, compensation. Or if the big brand name for a pharmaceutical company realizes that their patent is pretty weak, and that the generic companies probably going to prevail in that litigation, they'll pay them far more than they would have ever made when they release their generic drug in order to have the generic stay off the market during that time. Of course, the result is then you have these two players who are complicit in keeping the price high on that drug, and nobody but the consumer loses. The FTC has brought claims against the party, both the generic and the brand name manufacturers, in several circuit courts in our country. Unfortunately, up until very recently, all the circuit courts said, no, you know what, we're not going to dig into those settlement agreements. These two big companies thought that it made sense to avoid litigation, and they had a settlement agreement. And we're not going to dig into the terms of that settlement agreement. If it, if it works for them, it works for us. But recently, the Third Circuit said, you know what, no, we smell a big rat. This sounds like an antitrust monopoly issue to us, and we are going to dig into that agreement. And we're going to ask you parties, why are you doing this? Is there any reason that this would make sense to the consumer, or is it purely profit-driven for both companies? And the Third Circuit concluded that that's exactly what it was, purely profit motivation for both parties. So when, a circuit, when there are circuits that are split on an issue in this country, generally that's when the Supreme Court uh, gets involved. And in fact, the Supreme Court has gotten involved in this case. It's called, in case you want to um, 
keep up with it over the summer. It's FTC versus Watson Pharmaceuticals. Watson, I think, is now called Actavis, um, but same company. It's where the FTC has sued over this very issue. And oral arguments were had at the Supreme Court in March. And the blogs I had read about it suggested that the decision from the Supreme Court probably would have come down in June. But unfortunately, they, the Supreme Court issued four decisions on June 3rd, and, and none of them included this Watson case. And so I, I, I'm going to keep my eye out for the findings, you know, maybe in July or August. But the Supreme Court is going to issue a decision on this to see if maybe at least one of the creative ways that Big Pharma is extending their brand market it can kind of get quashed. So that's sort of the legal overview of the patent generic world. Phil, I know there's a huge um, monetary component to this discussion, and I'll turn it over to you to talk about that. Thank you very much, Don. Um, and we will all be very anxious to hear about um, the decision from the Supreme Court uh, regarding FTC versus Watson. Uh, I'm still just amazed that that, that is not automatically considered uh, uh, illegal. Uh, but like I said, we'll be, we'll be anxious to hear the outcome of that. Now when I think about workers' compensation in particular, there's really just a handful of single source brand drugs left that are the major cost drivers um, uh, in workers' compensation. Uh, and most of those uh, are on this screen in front of us. Um, if I were to add cardiac drugs to this list for those cardiac compensable claims, uh, this list would, would more than double. So that gives you some idea of how many patents are going to be expiring um, the remainder of this year and on into 2014. However, top of this list is OxyContin. We already know that that one has already been postponed. Uh, in fact, we at this point will not see a, a generic OxyContin probably until 2025. Uh, and we're going to go into to details on the OxyContin story in just a few minutes. Second one on the list, Lidoderm. Uh, remember today's uh, news headlines, Endo laying off 700 people. Directly related, in my mind, to the, uh, the patent expiration. Uh, Endo also makes Apana uh, ER. Um, Apana has gone generic, but I think there could be some interesting twist to that story, and we're going to discuss that as well in just a little while. Uh, Exalgo uh, will be expiring in November, uh, along with the patent on uh, Asafex. Uh, Cymbalta, um, very expensive uh, drug in the comp system. That will, will expire towards the end of this year. Now, Celebrex, the molecule that we uh, started our discussion with today. The patent on that was scheduled to expire uh, in about a year, May of 2014. But that has already been pushed out uh, further, right now, we're, we will not be seeing uh, the possibility of a generic until December 2015, and that's another story we're going to really dig into. Uh, Lunesta uh, for insomnia uh, pushed out to, or ex due to expire May of 2014, along with the patent on Nexium. So if, if we could rely on all these patents expiring, we would see significant cost reductions during this time, and some of them, I think, will expire on schedule. Um, to date, I have not come across uh, any litigation regarding lidoderm. Uh, so I'm, I'm very hopeful that the, the generic on lidoderm will become available uh, around September time frame of this year. Now what does this mean to the, the pharmaceutical industry? Well, it has a huge impact on, on their revenue and profits. What this graph is showing is the impact of a generic on brand name pharma's uh, annual sales. And as you can see, it, it's billions of dollars. So in 2012 was one of the, the most difficult years for Big Pharma. Um, generics took away approximately $35 billion in revenue. Slowed down a little bit in 2013, uh, will remain a little bit lower in 2014, uh, but in 2015 it's expected to surge to $33.5 billion. The significance of this is when you think about this in terms of lost revenue, lost profits for these companies, I don't think they're going to stand idly by. And to date, they have not. That is why there, there is so much litigation going on. Uh, this first caught my attention uh, December a year ago when the patent on Lipitor expired. Now, Lipitor is not a necessarily a big drug in comp, 
uh, unless you're dealing with cardiac compensable claims. But Lipitor was the best-selling drug of all time. Pfizer, the company that, that produced Lipitor, uh, it happens to be the world's largest pharmaceutical company, literally lost billions in profits when, when that drug patent expired. Uh, I seriously doubt if they're going to, to stand uh, idly by and let that happen too many more times. Uh, in fact, the patent on Lyrica, which is a, a cost driver in comp, uh, expired last year. But Pfizer was very quick to that one, uh, and, we're, and that, again, that's a case study that we're going to look at in just a moment. Now, let's start with, with an old drug, Scalaxin. It's been around almost as long as I have been. It's been around 50 years. Um, and yet, we did not see uh, a generic version of Scalaxin until the last couple of years, way beyond the 20-year patent um, uh, period, way beyond anything would have ever anyone would have ever predicted for this particular drug. Um, and yet, the manufacturer of, of Scalaxin uh, had a patent that's referred to as a, a U189 code, which refers to a patent on enhancement of the bioavailability of the drug substance. So as Don mentioned earlier, there's more than one kind of patent on a drug. Uh, so it's not just the molecule that we were looking at on that first slide. Uh, in this case, it's considered a, a method of use. And what it took to enhance the bioavailability of that drug was for a pharmacist to tell the patient, take scalaxin with food. Now, I'm pausing because I, I, I cannot tell you, as a pharmacist, how many times I have told patients to take their medication with food. And most of those drugs did not have a U189 patent. Uh, to me, this is exactly the type issue that the Supreme Court uh, in India uh, was trying to, to stop. Uh, it's this nonsensical type patent approach uh, that simply adds cost to the system. Now, Lyrica, um, as I said uh, earlier, produced by Pfizer. So they lose their, their patent on Lipitor. Uh, they're about to lose their um, uh, patent on Pfizer. And so what do they do? They sue Teva, who happens to be the world's largest generic manufacturer. Uh, truly a, a battle uh, of the giants. Uh, the lawsuit was based on patent infringement and irreparable harm. And basically what it came down to uh, again, uh, a drug that has more than one patent. So the first patent was on the active ingredient pregabalin. Uh, now that one would still be um, in effect through December of 2018. Then they had a patent on the method to treat seizures, which was good through October of 2013. And it was that October 2013 date that got everyone excited about the possibility of a, a generic Lyrica coming out. Uh, and then an additional patent on methods to treat pain which is also valid through 2018. Uh, the U.S. District Judge upheld the validity of these, and therefore the, the October 2013 date uh, came and went with, with no generic introduction. Uh, and so we're, we'll be looking at brand-only Lyrica uh, at least through 2018. Uh, in terms of what this means to Pfizer, their annual sales on this one drug alone in today's dollars is $3.7 billion. So uh, a huge moneymaker for them. Okay, Celebrex. Talked a little bit about this. So, so what's going on uh, with Celebrex? Um, original patent is due to expire in about a year. Uh, Teva, again, uh, is, is challenging uh, these patents. In 2008, uh, the Federal Court of Appeals uh, upheld the validity of these patents that were expiring in 2014. But they rule that another patent, a method of use patent, remember that, that same term that we used when we were referring to Scalaxin, uh, this Court of Appeals ruled that that method of use patent was invalid. And, uh, and that patent was, should have been valid through December of 2015, but the court stated that that amounted to the double patenting of claims. Um, to me, that court seems like they were, were more in line with the thinking of the uh, uh, Supreme Court in India when they made their ruling on the, the cancer drug that Don discussed earlier. However, um, this was, was pursued, and in March of 2013, 
the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office granted a reissue patent for the same method of use patents. So we have a court stating that the patent isn't valid. Then we have the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office coming back and reissuing these patents. So uh, as you can see, this is very convoluted. Um, to me, what this is saying is, is Big Pharma has deep pockets, and they will continue to pursue every avenue possible to, to preserve their sales. In this case, Celebrex worth $1.75 billion annually. Okay. Now we come to, to OxyContin. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about OxyContin beyond just the, the patent story. Um, OxyContin was first marketed in 1995. This is hard for some of us to um, acknowledge today, but that original patent was considered to be an abuse deterrent formula. Um, I know many of you have heard me tell this story before, but what it amounts to is OxyContin is a slow-release formulation. So it has a, a shell. It's not a typical tablet that dissolves. It has a shell that does not dissolve, passes through the body, uh, but during that transit slowly releases the active ingredient oxycodone. The slow release is why it was considered abuse deterrent. The faster an opioid like oxycodone goes to work, the greater the euphoria or the high that it produces, and the greater the likelihood uh, of uh, addiction to that drug. So the theory is the faster it goes to work, the more likely it's going to be addicting. And that's very true. That's why drug addicts so often try to find ways uh, of injecting what otherwise would be considered an oral drug, because injection is the fastest way to get it in the body. So Purdue slowed down the release of this drug. Great theory. If you slow it down, people should not experience euphoria. They should not become addicted. So it was abuse deterrent. Very quickly, what happened after it hit the market, and whether it was by accident or by design, didn't take long for folks to figure out that all one had to do was to either chew or crush the OxyContin tablet, and it would immediately release all the oxycodone. So it became a highly uh, abused drug. During this time, though, Purdue was, was working with uh, a number of individuals, and they produced a video called I Got My Life Back. Uh, it was produced in 1998. It was distributed to 15,000 physicians across the country without FDA approval. Um, I find it ironic that a few years ago, I could find this video online. If I search for it today, I can't find it. I found one copy at UCLA in Los Angeles in their College of Medicine library. So if you want to see this video, that's the only place I've been able to locate it. It has been wiped off uh, the face of the Internet. What I have found, though, as a follow-up to this video, um, there were 15 people in the original uh, I Got My Life Back, and basically they were all talking about how miraculous OxyContin was, how wonderful it did, how it turned their lives around. The follow-up video that was produced just a few years ago tracks five of these 15 uh, individuals. Um, briefly, three of them uh, are dead from drug overdose. Uh, the other two are still proponents of oxycodone. And I like this follow-up video because it is very fair. It's very balanced. It shows the worst outcome of OxyContin, but it also shows that there are patients that have been on it for years that need it and benefit from it. The original video was, was very one-sided. What we also know since that point in time, um, there was an article in uh, the Wall Street Journal December of last year uh, that interviewed a Dr. Russell Portnoy. Dr. Portnoy was very instrumental in working with Purdue Pharma. Um, and going back to the 90s, we probably did have a situation where some patients in, were being undertreated for their pain. Dr. Portnoy and Purdue Pharma, uh, along with this video, did a lot to convince physicians that they were being too conservative with um, uh, their use of opioids. Unfortunately, Dr. Portnoy went on record of making statements such as uh, OxyContin is 
not addictive. Uh, he made a statement that less than 1% of patients that took this drug would become addicted. Uh, he made other statements. The December last year article in the Wall Street Journal is when he came forward um, and basically uh, admitted that he lied. Um, uh, the, the phrase the author of the article used was that uh, Dr. Portnoy knowingly made false statements uh, about this drug. Uh, unfortunately, the damage was, was done at that point. So after that, the DEA got very involved. They were very concerned over Purdue's aggressive marketing of this drug. Uh, the FDA uh, has taken two actions against Purdue uh, for advertising violations. Um, three executives at Purdue Pharma in 2007 uh, pleaded guilty to misbranding uh, and paid $635 million in fines. Now, if we consider the billions of dollars in revenue and profits that this drug has, has made, I don't think those fines would uh, in any way be considered egregious. Um, in fact, some would say they, they should have been much higher. So getting back to the patent story. So the, the patent on OxyContin expired uh, April 17th of 2013. Uh, January of this year, I was still optimistic that we, we might see one. But let's go back a little ways. Um, this would have been the third time we had possibly seen a generic launch of OxyContin. First time was several years ago when the original patent expired. Uh, generic drug hit the market, was on the market for uh, a period of, of nine months to a little less than a year, at which point Purdue sued the generic manufacturer. The court sided with Purdue because Purdue had more than one patent. The patent that was upheld was the patent on that slow-release shell. So the court ordered the, the, farm, the generic companies to quit producing uh, generic um, OxyContin. The next time we saw generic OxyContin hit the market was very short-lived. It occurred right before the reformulated version of OxyContin hit the market in August of 2010. And it was basically OxyContin. It was produced by Purdue. It was labeled and marketed as a generic version. Uh, in essence, what it allowed Purdue to, to accomplish was to clear out their existing stockpile of old formulation OxyContin. So again, we had a, a generic for a while, and then it evaporated and was no longer available in the market. So April of this year would have been the third time we anticipated a generic version. Um, Purdue was able, though, to um, avoid this generic launch largely through actions from the FDA. And this is a, a, a tough story and I've thought long and hard about this, and, and I'm not on the fence. I very much uh, approve what the action the FDA took, but to say that is with the caveat that this applies when OxyContin is prescribed appropriately. So, so don't misunderstand any statements I make about the, the protection of this patent to think I'm encouraging the use of OxyContin. I am not only when it is truly indicated, only when it is truly prescribed appropriately. But in those situations, the FDA, remember they're charged with making sure that drugs are safe and effective. Safety is paramount. The whole reason that OxyContin was reformulated in uh, August of 2010 was an overall part of the, the FDA's REMS program, uh, REMS, which is Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy. That is when uh, opioids and other dangerous drugs were required by the FDA for the manufacturer to ensure their safety. OxyContin was not safe in that formulation. It was way too easy to abuse. Literally all it took was grinding it up uh, and addicts could, could do whatever they wanted to with it. The reformulated version changed that, makes it very difficult for anyone to intentionally bypass that slow release formula. Now, can it be done? Yes, probably. But I've heard from sources as far apart as Danville, Illinois, to um, uh, West Palm Beach, Florida, uh, Dr. Sanford Silverman down there, telling me that when, when he's treating patients with an addiction problem involving OxyContin, those patients started telling him, hey, I can't abuse this, this drug anymore. 
So that lends credence to the, the, the idea that the reformulated version is less likely, less easily available for abuse. The other thing, and sort of the sad part of this story, is what we also know is that for the first time in decades, abuse of heroin is now on the increase. We think, uh, and physicians like Dr. Silverman support that idea, we think that the addicts that can no longer abuse these new formulations are actually turning to street heroin. The, the third idea that, that lends support to the fact that the reformulated version actually works is OxyContin was reformulated before Opana ER. There was a significant rise in the use of, of Opana ER after the reformulated OxyContin hit the market. So, so addicts moved from OxyContin to Opana ER, which is what earned it the name from uh, USA Today of the most dangerous drug in America. But then Opana ER also went on to be reformulated. So long story, but what it amounts to is that the FDA could not approve a generic version of OxyContin that was related to the original formula. It would have been the equivalent of, of putting us right back to where we were before the reformulated version. So that didn't happen. Um, what this is going to mean to us is that now the FDA can use abuse deterrence uh, as a, a, a method of approving uh, generic releases of drugs. And this could have even further implication for workers' compensation because generic Opana ER is already on the market. This decision on OxyContin could actually cause the FDA to go back and reevaluate and pull uh, that generic version off the market, returning us to a single source of HANA ER. Uh, time will tell on that particular one. So in, in summary, um, I, we, we know that patents on single source brand name drugs uh, are going to continue to expire at unprecedented rates. Uh, as a result of that, generic availability and generic substitution is going to continue to increase. That's going to mean, though, that we will see uh, new and ongoing litigation to try to delay this generic entry is also going to increase. And then lastly, think of the pharmaceutical market as a, a worldwide market. It's not just the United States uh, and our patent system. Uh, even though there are trade agreements in place, there are countries, uh, courts like, uh, like India, that are very pro-generic that are going to continue to fight this battle. And, and results in those countries definitely are going to have an impact on decisions that are made in the United States. So with that, Lori, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Phil. We're going to take a few minutes uh, that we have left to do some questions. So again, if you have a question, uh, and you have not yet uh, sent it in to us, please do so. And the first question that I have, um, I think I'm going to uh, direct this to Dawn. Um, do pharma companies that try to extend a patent have any burden of proof that they have not yet recouped their, recouped their R&D costs? Um, no, there's no requirement that they show anything about their profitability. When the FDA reviews um, the drug, they're looking for efficacy and safety. They don't, they don't really look at anything related to profit as far as I know. Okay. Um, this next one I think, uh, Phil, I'll, I'll direct to you. Um, why are so many drugs allowed to be used off-use or I guess off-label for treatment of conditions for which they were never intended? That's a great question. Um, the first place my mind heads with that is Congress has, has never had an appetite for legislating how a physician practices medicine. And, and I think that's very appropriate. So that leaves these decisions in the hand, uh, hands of the physicians uh, in terms of making ethical decisions. Off-label use has been synonymous with uh, bad behavior for quite a while. Uh, in fact, CMS, when it came to Medicare Part D, sort of uh, enforced this mindset when they stated that they weren't going to cover off-label use. Uh, in addition, several pharmaceutical companies, because of marketing practices, have paid significant fines because of off-label use. So we have a, a, a 
numerous instances of where off-label use is bad. But my message is not all off-label use is necessarily a bad thing. A classic example being gabapentin. Gabapentin, a uh, generic version of Neurontin, is approved for treating seizures. So it's in a class of drugs known as anticonvulsants. And yet the guidelines, whether we look at ACOM or ODG, are going to consider gabapentin a first-line agent in the treatment of neuropathic pain, even though that's off-label. So for the ind individual physician practitioner, what they need to look at is the evidence that supports off-label use. If there's no evidence, it shouldn't occur. The worst example in my mind of off-label use that should not have occurred was the use of drugs like Actique, which are intended only for end-of-life cancer pain being used for pain associated with, with low back injuries. So there's two sides to every story. Um, but I think off-label use is going to be left in the hands of the treating physicians. Okay, thank you, Phil. And you just mentioned Actique, and we actually had a question about that. Um, someone just asking, you know, what's happened to Actique? Uh, it was obviously being used more and more uh, with more frequency, increasing dosages. So maybe you can give a little update on that. Yeah. Um, Actique should be wiped out of the workers' compensation system. Uh, never should have been used here Anyway, uh, as I stated earlier, the intended use for Actique is for one purpose. That's end-of-life uh, cancer pain. Uh, if, if, for those of you in the audience not familiar with this drug, this is the lollipop version of fentanyl citrate. Uh, sounds horrible to make a, a drug like that as a lollipop, but in certain situations where someone is at the end of life and they want to be at home, it is a very compassionate drug. Its use outside of that scenario, though, is very inappropriate. Um, it goes to work very fast. Remember what I said earlier about fast-acting opioids. They're a lot more prone to uh, addiction, uh, a lot more prone to, to misuse and abuse. So Actique was highly abused. What the FDA has done since the release of Actique and Ventura, it has been to develop the REMS program. Uh, REMS now applies to all drugs in this category. Uh, and you may not be aware of it because hopefully REMS is doing what it's supposed to. There have been about five new drugs very similar to Actique that have been released in the last couple of years. And for the most part, they are being effectively kept out of the workers' compensation system. So, so REMS is having some effect, but unfortunately Actique hit the market before REMS even existed. Okay, thank you. Um, Don, here's another question I'm going to direct to you. Uh, the question is, when a patent is extended, is it for another 20 years or some other time period that varies by circumstance? What's the typical extension? Okay, that's a great question. I did want to uh, mention, just by way of anecdote, that several years ago I had a case in which a claimant had rebound headaches, migraine headaches, and her neurologist prescribed Actique lollipop, believe it or not. And um, it was a horrible outcome. She ended up overdosing on the lollipops, and she died. So it's horrible misuse of that drug. Um, so the REMS program hopefully is helping that not to occur. Um, with regard to the patent extension, if, if, it's a, if it's a patent on a new indication or a new formulation, then it would be reissued for 20 years. Um, I mentioned earlier that there, the FDA does allow market exclusive, exclusivity extensions. Um, to compensate for, you know, the FDA approval process. And in those cases, the extensions could range anywhere from two to five years. It just depends on how the, it, whether it's a reissue or a new patent really determines how long the patent will be. Okay, great. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I'm going to throw this out to Phil first, and then, Don, you might also have a, some input on it. Um, in workers' comp, is there any movement by the law to require generic medications where generics are available, such as in, on the group health side? Yeah, uh, another great question. And actually, um, I'm not sure what state this question is coming from, but I would encourage you to look at legislation in some of the other states. So basically, we have what I consider to be three different types of generic states in the workers' compensation system. Um, there are states that are generic mandatory, meaning that with one exception, generics have to be used when they're available. That exception being a physician that determines that the brand name is medically necessary. The second type of state is a non-generic mandatory, 
which means two individuals have the right to determine if a brand name is necessary, the doctor or the injured patient. Then the third type of state is a state that will allow a patient to determine that they need or want the brand name, but they're required to pay uh, what's considered a copay differential between the brand and generic. Uh, Texas, Tennessee, Wisconsin are, are states that come to mind in this latter category. So in those states, they didn't take the rights away from the individual. They simply said if you're going to obtain the generic, the comp system is not going to pay for you to obtain that brand name drug. You're going to pay the difference. So like I said, I would, I would encourage you to, um, to look at some of the, the different statutes in these different states. And I don't thank have you. Oh, go ahead, Don. No, I was just going to say I don't have a whole lot to add to that, except North Carolina has undergone significant workers' comp changes recently, but unfortunately, generic mandating is not one of those. Okay. Well, just a couple quick um, reminders. Um, again, if you are going to be seeking CE credit for this session, you'll be getting an email very shortly with a link, so please be sure you click on that and register. Um, and we'll also be sending out a survey. We'd love to get your feedback and ideas for future topics you'd like to see us cover. So please take a few moments to fill that out and get it back to us. Um, thank you again for joining us. And thank you to our speakers, Phil. Thank you, Don. And um, we'll be holding another seminar um, in the next few months. So be on the lookout for information on that. Thank you again for joining us.